For over half a century, Canada has been a world leader in the production, use, and development of life-saving medical isotopes. The world is counting on Canada to expand this leadership role to support the diagnosis and treatment of cancer, ensuring medical equipment is safe for use, and to tackle some of our greatest challenges in health sciences. Welcome to the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council's Isotopes for Hope podcast with your host, James Skoniak, Chair of the CNIC. In this series, we interview Canadian leaders who are making a difference every day. We hope you enjoy this episode of the Isotopes for Hope podcast. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, David Harris and Dr. Travis Bassanger for joining me on the Isotopes for Hope podcast today. I'm really excited to have both of these gentlemen with us today. I've had the opportunity to work with them both, and I can tell you they are both impressive leaders and champions of everything we do here in Canada on isotopes. So thank you, David and uh, Travis, for joining us today. Um, I want to start by introducing David more uh, formally. I'll start with David. Um, David is the president and CEO of Kinetrix. Um, he joined Kinetrix in 2003 uh, and um, has really been an instrumental leader in that organization for the last uh, two uh, decades. Um, Kinetrix is a Canadian-based management-owned company. They provide elect, uh, services to the electricity industry, but nuclear in particular in Canada, the United States, and uh, internationally. Um, you, you know, David, in my role at Bruce Power, I have the opportunity to work a lot with, with you and your colleagues at Kinetrix. There's 1,300 individuals that call Kinetrix home. And I can tell you they're, they're an absolutely critical organization for our, our nuclear fleet, not only here in Ontario, but but across Canada and uh, look forward to talking a little bit later about your role in isotopes. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Travis Bassanger um, uh, serves as the uh, Senior Business and Technical Director for Medical Isotopes at Kinetrix. But uh, Tra Travis has a long-standing career in the commercialization of radiopharmaceutical and medical isotope products. Uh, before joining Kinetrix, Travis held roles uh, as the Chief Business Officer at the CPDC. And for those of you that don't know uh, the CPDC, it's the Center for Probe Development and Commercialization, just a, a fantastic organization who are also members of the, the CNIC um, and uh, has a PhD in chemistry from McMaster University. So uh, between both David and, and Travis, we have a lot of brain power uh, here today. But also I had the opportunity to work a lot with Travis uh, over many years um, in his leadership roles at Isogen, in particular around developing Lutetium-177. And so here today you have um, not only individuals that are strong leaders and strong backgrounds, but people that are really committed to the space. So uh, David, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start uh, with you. Um, uh, you know, Kinetrix is an organization that over the last um, uh, couple of decades uh, has continued to uh, build and expand. Um, the work that you do, uh, not only here in Canada, but around the world. Can you talk about as sitting in the president and CEO's chair, um, you know, what, what was it that uh, triggered you to, to say, you know, hey, we want to open up a new front here. We, we want to look at medical isotopes. And can you kind of sort of walk us through that, that thought process and what drove that? So great, great question, James. And thank you for the opportunity to be here and to, to take part in this podcast. Why did we get into the medical isotope business? I guess I was on a plane, I remember it clearly, and I was reading a review of Lutetium 177, how it was produced, the benefits to humanity, the way that it not only is a diagnostic, but it actually is a therapeutic as well. It actually kills cancer cells. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be great to actually be able to um, demonstrate how nuclear power can not only produce low-cost, affordable green electricity, but also um, medical isotopes and save people's lives. And I just thought this was would be a cool thing for Kinetrix to do. I thought it would energize and engage the company. And it's, it's where I wanted to put money. It's where I wanted Kinetrix to invest, right. is doing things that help make the world a better place and help save people's lives. And Lutetium medical isotopes ticks those boxes. So, so David, you, you, your organization supports um, uh, reactors all over the world. 
can do reactors, BWRs, PWRs, all, all different designs. You have a, a significant uh, technical capability. What is it about our, our can do reactors here in Ontario and in Canada that from your perspective really lined up with that lutetium opportunity you talked about? So it's a great question. I think the can do reactors are unique in the fact that they operate 24 seven which a lot of the research reactors don't do, but they also have really long runs because they are refueled online. They're typically up for two, two plus years. And that, that makes them different from other reactors in that they can be very reliable in terms of being able to deliver uh, medical isotopes. But on top of that, they don't have thick wall pressure vessels. The calandria is pretty close to atmospheric pressure it's a less than 100 degrees centigrade. So it's easy to get um, stable isotopes into the core to be irradiated and take them out as medical isotopes. And to get a tiny bit technical, the uh, flux profile, the, the neutron flux right, right. is pretty good for irradiating medical isotopes. And those things make the can do just the best around for producing medical isotopes. But David, that's really a game changer in the sense of um, the vision there with traditionally in Canada and around the world, our foundation of production has been cyclotrons for cyclotron based isotopes and research reactors. So to your point, going to a 24 seven commercial power reactor really provides that reliability. It provides the reliability and it's worth spending a minute just thinking about you're a surgeon. You've got a patient coming in, the patient wants life saving, um, treatment and the medical isotopes don't turn up because the reactor hasn't operated and with can do's we minimize the chance of that happening and we minimize the chance of there being a really bad day for an individual and for a family and that's 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 can do's are very very good for that with their reliability 24 7 long runs and long duration so I really want to pick up that point with you, uh, 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 Travis, and if we kind of take a step back and we think about this from a patient perspective, and I really, you know, as we get into this conversation, I really want to get your insights on the global market as well. But from a patient perspective, you know, David talks about, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners may not be able to delineate when we talk about lutetium versus molybdenum versus iodine. From a patient perspective, when you take lutetium, which is the, the isotope that, that you have led, and, and you know, my role at Bruce Power, we've had the, the privilege of working together. Can you talk about what, what's unique about lutetium to build on David's comments from a patient perspective? You go up the street here to Princess Margaret Hospital. Why is lutetium important to a cancer patient? Sure, sure. So you know, there's been a, a number of different medical isotopes used for therapy over the years. And you know, lutetium is actually, I'd say, more um, one of the more newer isotopes. If you you know went back in history, probably the most prevalent isotope used for therapy was iodine-131, and um, it's uh, it's been used for thyroid cancer treatment. Still is commonly used, very very effective. Um, well, there's another uh, another drug, and this one I had worked on a number of years ago, and actually up at SickKids Hospital, uh, they use this drug. It's uh, called MIBG. It's the acronym. It's got a longer name too. If you want to look it up. But it's used to treat a very rare um, brain tumor, neuroblastoma. And uh, the thing with iodine is it's, it's very energetic. So you need a lot of shielding to protect um, the nurses and physicians after right, the patient's course. been administered. So, you know, uh, they have a room. There's one up at Sick Kids where kids are administered this treatment. And it's, uh, you know, this, this disease is very debilitating. And it's very, very young patients like these are these are babies essentially they're very young kids and they have a therapy room that the child goes into and they're separate from their parents during the treatment uh, it could be for days um, and so the drug is really well you know it's well tolerated it's, it has great impact but the experience of, of taking that drug is is not great for you know for a child Luti seems a bit different it's its energy profile is such that a patient could be given it in the hospital and they can go home that day. Um, so you're not getting a lot of the stray radiation that needs to be shielded and protected from the public. So it makes it a lot easier through for the patient to take and the families to be able to 
manage the patient as they come home. Better for the hospitals to, to manage as well. You don't need very specialized rooms to be able to take these therapies. Right. So it just has, you know, it checks the box in terms of a good isotope that has the same therapeutic ability as, a, as an isotope like I-131, but is way, way easier to administer, way better for the patient. So. No, that, that's important, and, and, it, and it really hits home uh, when you're talking about any cancer patient, but, but kids in particular. And, uh, and I know... Um, uh, Kinetrix, uh, we've had the opportunity to work together, and, and Kinetrix is a big supporter of the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, as you know, a, a charity close to, to, to my heart. And so, you know, not only appreciate the work that you're doing on the isotope front and have done, but but also your your, your charitable work. It, it means uh, it means a lot. Um, Travis, and I want to kind of shift to the sort of the global outlook. Um, if you fast forward, and, and we can't predict the future. Um, but there are, there are certain uh, likely irreversible trends at play in radiopharmaceuticals around the world right now. Um, and if we sort of looked at this over a 10 to 15 year period, if, if we were sitting here in 2040, 2035, um, what, what do you think that global demand for isotopes is gonna look like generically, whether it's a theranostic, diagnostic, and how should we as Canadians be thinking about our role in that? So, you know, I think we're, we're really at the beginning now, kind of a renaissance in the industry term. And, you know, it's really the therapeutic products, in um, particular the ones using lutetium that are uh, growing rapidly. So, you know, I see the volumes we're producing today and globally and here in Canada as being, you know, 10, 20 percent of what the future may be. So we could see, you know, m many multiples of uh, demand increase for these isotopes. Um, you know, there's only a few products on the market using lutetium today. We have Lutathera and, and Pluvicto, both from Novartis. Um, but, you know, that's, it's early days for the, those drugs as well. They're expanding the indication. So and we could see a market that's maybe a, you know, a billion dollars today expand to, you know, 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. Um, so there's big opportunity for, for Canada to play a role in that. And as we spoke about earlier, the CANDU reactor is really, you know, kind of the, the key piece of infrastructure that can enable that industry to grow. And when you're, uh, you're a pharmaceutical company, you're looking to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in could be five, 10 years of, of effort to put a new drug to market. If you don't know the key ingredient for that drug is going to be there and going to be readily available. How do, you, how do you even jump in? Yeah. So you, you need to know that the infrastructure is there, um, the supply chain is there, so you can actually market this, these products and, and they have a clear growth path. So we've talked a lot about, and, and David, a, a lot about the, the, the need, the opportunity, the, the, the vision. Um, it, you know, there's, there's recently a report out through the Toronto Region Board of Trade uh, through Life Sciences Ontario that talks about over the last number of years in Ontario, the, the sort of the broader life sciences sector, and I'd fit this, you know, center, square center in that, um, has attracted $3 billion of investment, which is very, very significant for a province of our size and certainly uh, notable from a global uh, point of view. So David, I wanna, wanna shift to the issue of investment. Uh, it, it's, it's one thing to talk about these items. There, there's obviously the, the intrinsic value. We all want to make a difference. It's what really gets us up in the morning. But you and the team at Framatome, can you talk about your, the, the process around investment decisions? Like you, you put your money where your mouth is. Uh, you you have formed Isagen, a partnership with Framatome. Uh, you know, one of the things I always remind people with my Bruce Power hat on is that the the lutetium system we're talking about it it's Isogen's uh, delivery system. I, Isogen invested your obviously we invested in in certain components with the plant. Um, that was a material investment for your organization, and 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 I think a very bold investment also in something fairly new, first of a kind. Can you talk about that that thought process? Um, Obviously, not without its challenges, um, but but as you look back, just just sort of walk us through, you know, somebody who's thinking about this from an investor point of view. What, what would you want to share with them on how you 
yeah, that evolution? It's, 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 a, it's a great question, and it pulls together a number of different aspects. So at the end of the day, yeah, there is a spreadsheet that shows that we do get a good financial return. So ultimately, I believed that, and I still believe, not past tense, I still believe that it will be a good investment in terms of dollars and cents. But a lot more goes into it than just that. So firstly, technical risk. Do I think we can do this? This has not done, been done before by a um, commercial power reactor. And I have huge confidence in the engineers and scientists in Kinetrix that we can design a system, we can build a system, we can working with Bruce Power, get it licensed and put the license case, case in to show that it can operate safely without disrupting power generation at Bruce Power. So I've got huge confidence that we can manage the technical risk. I've got huge confidence in Ontario and Bruce Power and what I mean by that is, I think that Ontario is committed to nuclear. And I think there's some jurisdictions around the world um, that it seem to be on the fence about nuclear or getting out of nuclear and wouldn't have invested in those jurisdictions. But thanks to the government we've got in Ontario, um, I felt there was a stable long-term future for nuclear. And got to give credit to Bruce Power. And Bruce ought to come out throughout this with having credit because they had the vision, they wanted to do more than just produce electricity, they wanted to be able to develop the Canadian economy in this area, but also show the social benefit of nuclear. Nuclear isn't just about clean energy, it's also about saving people's lives. And all of those factors played in, the technical risk, the societal risk, the benefits to society, and sure, then we have a spreadsheet that says sure. that this is, a, this is a good investment. But David, I think that's an important message uh, really around um, policy stability. And, and, and some, sometimes uh, the best way government can support is just by providing stability. Uh, I, you know, one of the things I would also add that I, that I think David is, is a unique attribute here in Canada is we have an independent uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. So you have your, your your policy certainty at the provincial level in terms of nuclear energy, but an independent regulator. And and not that the regulator doesn't have tough questions and hold us to account, but, but for this project, the regulator recognized the societal need for this and, and, and I think was um, rigorous but um, innovative in terms of the, the regulatory approvals as well. Absolutely. I think the, the CNSC played a great job in... Um, Asking, as you say, insightful questions and making sure it's safe, but, but moving, moving forwards with this. And just come back to, to the societal benefit. I mean, the fact that Bruce Power has a plan to move out to 2064 and beyond in right. terms of investing in the reactors, refurbishing the reactors, that says these are here for the long term. This is worth investing in an infrastructure around this because of the long, long sight line we've got. And just picking up on that theme of policy stability or stability in general, uh, you know, Travis, you throughout your career and currently now, you, you know, you, you've worked with a lot of pharmaceutical companies. You, you know that, that sector. Um, I would imagine from a, from a cost of the end drug, and, and uh, unfortunately that is a factor in the world we live in in a lot of countries outside of Canada where we don't have access to a public health care system. We're very blessed here in Canada. But I would imagine the stability of the isotope production that we offer uh, also has an added benefit of with stability should come price, um, uh, uh, price stability, uh, lower cost price, better predictability. Can you talk about that, how the pharmaceutical, you know, we're talking about a global market here, right? We're we're a great country of just under 40 million people, but we're talking about a market for radio, radio pharmaceuticals of billions of people. Can you talk about how a pharmaceutical company would, will look at this equation uh, in terms of that stability? Yeah, sure. Well, there's, the stability is paramount, so they you need that dependable supply. Um, the economics is, uh, is, I think, an also very important point. So uh, these radio pharmaceutical products, they're, they're, they're expensive products provide to patients. Um, you know, the pharmaceutical companies want to, to make a good return on their investments as well. They're, 
these are very, very large investments, you know, hundreds of millions, if not close to a billion dollars to put a new product to market. So you need a good cost of goods to be able to make that a viable investment. Um, so if we look you know, across, you know, you look internationally at the, um, the different ways to make an isotope lutetium, and, uh, you know, Ontario really has a unique competitive advantage. We have the existing infrastructure in the can-do reactors to be able to do this cost-effectively. The investment that Isogen put into the, uh, the Bruce Power Reactor was not trivial. It was a big investment. But if you look at it in context of building a new research reactor, um, which could be you know, billions of dollars, um, you know, I think lots of... Um, you know, people that are working on those programs uh, have estimates that be less than that, but um, it's it's going to be orders of magnitude more investment. So the you know the return they'll need to be able to recoup those um, you know the cash they would put out to build that kind of infrastructure is you know, I, I just can't see how the economics would work to produce right. the ice dough. So you know we in Canada have you know, eight reactors units of Bruce Power. We have the Darlington units. Um, we have nearly endless limit to produce isotope. We can do it high quality. So, you know, you can make a better product and there's a way better probability that we can do it cheaper than anywhere else in the world. Um, so Canada can be the, the place to go for the entire industry uh, for the best product at the best price. Um, and it can be very dependable. So huge advantage here in Canada. And we can do it uh, with a very manageable investment. No, and I and I and, you know, and I think that's a really important point because it, it's unfortunate that sometimes in the same dialogue of saving somebody's life, we're having an economic discussion. But globally, unfortunately, that that's just a reality of the world we live in. And and what what I'm very proud about as a Canadian and Ontarian, and what we've been able to do here, is we're not able to fix the entire challenges with you know what it costs to get a pharmaceutical product to a patient and and those factors that you articulated but we are part of the solution in terms of that back to that foundation of investing which is stability stability in technology stability in in um, in reliability stability in um in all of the public policy elements and and you know we can't can't lose sight of that and frankly i think that's a competitive advantage Final question for, for both of you. Um, if we think about this from a, from a Canadian perspective, I mean, you both have traveled the world, you've done business globally uh, in, in a number of areas. Why, and I'll start with you, David, why are isotopes an area, you know, why, why is this a spot we should go after? You know, you know we, we've talked about sort of the individual advantages of the project, but you know, why is this a sweet spot for Canada? I think it's a sweet spot for Canada historically. The NRU up at Chalk River produced a lot of isotopes. But I think we've got a very smart, well-educated workforce that can turn their hands to um, developing isotope um, production equipment. I think the can-do reactors, it's almost limitless neutrons available. Uh, from the can-do reactors, particularly the eight big units of Bruce, Darlington as, as well. And then the, the infrastructure. We can actually do the separation of the stable isotope from the medical, the radioactive isotope. So great logistics to get it in, in and out. So I think, Canada, I think Canada has got all that's required to be able to develop. And I'd just like to add one other thing to that. Because it all starts with a stable isotope and high purity, and that's what goes into the reactor to produce lutetium. And at the moment, the world is over-dependent upon Russia to produce these stable isotopes. And Kinetrix in Canada is trying to change that. And we now are producing the highly enriched stable isotope that goes into the reactor. And that's really important in terms of global security with, with everything we've seen. I would like to, to call it uh, ethical stable isotopes because Absolutely. it doesn't come from, from, from Russia. And again, that's, that's private investment given the long-term confidence we've got in this market that we've invested in two technologies 
to produce stable isotopes. So that's, that's now happening. So it really is a virtuous circle where the policy stability, the progressiveness of Bruce Power, the CNSC taking a pragmatic but very safety conscious view allows Canada to grow an industry. So Travis, last, last point to you. Why do you think this should be a sweet spot for, for Canada? Yeah, I think it kind of leads on the, you know, Canada's history in, in nuclear development. If you look globally, wh where is the innovation happening? Where, where are radiopharmaceuticals being um, developed? And you know, Canada, you know, use some of your terms, James, punches well above its weight. Um, and that's because we have a couple of key pieces of infrastructure we have. Uh, well, the CANDU, we, we talked a lot, but we can't forget uh, McMaster University. So right. there's the research reactor there, uh, which continues to train you know, young scientists and engineers. We have the, uh, the Particle Accelerator National Lab Triumph in Vancouver. And if you look around those, those infrastructure, and CNL, of course, uh, we can't forget um, being another key infrastructure in Canada. So you start seeing companies form up around these places of higher education that have these unique assets. And so, you know, if you look here in Ontario, we have um, out, you know, out of the uh, McMaster reactor ecosystem, we have uh, Fusion Pharmaceuticals, we have Point Biopharma, Atom V, um, all forming up around that uh, particular piece of infrastructure and the, and the talent that those universities create. Triumph, we have um, Abdera, we have Alpha 9 Therapeutics. Right. Um, again, the, these companies forming around that key infrastructure. So we have the innovation, we have some of this really key technology and unique infrastructure. And I think where it'd be nice to see that continue to develop is, you know, we want to see companies starting to form up around the can-do infrastructure as well. Um, the, um, you know, there's ecosystems forming up, uh, one is in Indianapolis, all the major farmers are going there because there's a really um, easy route or proven route to do large-scale manufacturing with isotopes. So that should be the next step for Canada. We need to work with our government, uh, work with, uh, you know, Department of Economic Development, our regulator, to really facilitate not just having innovative products being developed, which is great, we're doing a good job in Canada of that, but we want to keep the manufacturing infrastructure here in Canada for those high-value products. And I think around the candy reactors is really kind of the, the next opportunity uh, for us to go after. Well, look, thanks very much, guys. I think this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, congratulations to you and the, uh, all the people at Kinetrix for, for what you do uh, in, in, in your leadership. And, you know, r really just to, to wrap up um, the, the, the message and, and when I you know, have, have the opportunity to have this dialogue with you, whether it's here on this podcast or outside the podcast, uh, when we're doing work together is just the pride in this space. And I think as, um, as Canadians, we live in a great country and, uh, we want to make a difference. And I think it's a, it's, it's incredibly motivating. It's incredibly rewarding. Um, but I think as, as David and uh, Travis, as you both point out, not only are these unique attributes that Canada has for, for us to tackle this opportunity, but we are also uniquely placed in the sense that other countries around the world don't have this infrastructure. And if, and if we do not seize this, this moment, we, we are going to have a, a global market that's short. So again, thank you very much for, for joining me today and pass on uh, our, our thanks and appreciation for everybody that contributes at Connectrix. Thanks, James. Thank Great you. session. Very good. Yeah, thanks thank for having you. us. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council Isotopes for Hope podcast with James Skoniak. Please share this podcast and follow us to stay in the loop. To learn more, please visit our website at canadianisotopes.ca.